Okay, well, a very warm welcome everyone to this session, All Hands on Deck, Shaping an Inclusive Future of AI, which is really the final panel uh, of this global forum. And I think we have exactly one hour. Could I first of all invite Daphna Feinholz? Yeah, could I first of all invite uh, Daphna Feinholz, the Chief of Section of Bioethics and Ethics of Science and Technology, to provide a brief welcome note. Hello, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. It's very briefly, and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to, uh, to present this in it very challenging this last session. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, I, since uh, I just want to give you a bit of a, a framework of, of context why we're having this session. So we have been having this uh, two or if, if we, three, if we, come, uh, if we count this day zero, uh, discussing a lot of AI and um, locally as we wanted in a global manner, including and covering all the di all kind of diversities. Uh, geographically, we have uh, all the Americas from the very north to the very south <laughs> and the Caribbean as well. Uh, we have gender. Uh, we have, I, I mean, in geographical, we have Asia and we have Europe and we have the Arab region and we have the gender and thematically we have been very diverse. We have been discussing issues of governance, inequalities, gender as the last panel, uh, among many other things. We have been launching very important networks to support the implementation of the recommendation like the Experts Without Borders, but also the Business Council and the Global Observatory. And uh, we have had also a lot of diversity in stakeholders. We have had a very high level decision makers, academia, researchers, that we also did a call of papers, and of course the private sector. Uh, but uh, there is some, uh, so we are coming into the, la it's not a coincidence that we're coming to a last session in which again, we have a diversity of stakeholders, but this one has a particularity that includes one particular stakeholder that normally is not so much included and visible and present in the discussions, which are the users, the other kind of experts that we were discussing in some previous panels, which are not necessarily the academia, academia or, the, or the ones who are making the decisions, but the people who are going to be using or, uh, pro or uh, in fact also producing, but also affected by these technologies. So there will be a specific, uh, a specific emphasis on civil society and civil uh, civil society organizations uh, so and this is very very important for UNESCO and for the for the strategy of implementing the recommendation so I'm looking forward to this very uh, interesting panel and looking forward also to the again another diverse conversation and the, your different views from your different areas of expertise on how we can move together in building the governance of AI back to the moderator Now, as many of the previous sessions have shown, AI systems and emerging applications, they are simply too complex and they have too far-reaching consequences to be decided upon by a few stakeholders alone, especially governments and, and, and corporation and private sector. So more diversity is indeed uh, required. And for this reason, this session explores strategies and examples to achieve more inclusive and multi, uh, public and multi-stakeholder participation in the global debate, the design and governance of AI. And the session aims in particular to generate ideas to achieve more inclusive decision-making, to align the deployment of uh, AI with societal needs and values, and of course to help to anticipate and also mitigate you know, potential risks and you know, potentially negative downstream implications. Now, we have an amazing set of speakers and panelists today. We have uh, panelists and speakers coming from civil societal organizations from around the world. We have from various AI research institutes, as well as also uh, various policy advisors and social scientists. Um, so we have, we still have, I think, one hour almost available, and we have two rounds of, you know, two rounds with 20 and 25 minutes. So this means with a panel of 12 speakers, the time is quite limited. So maybe 90 seconds to two minutes per intervention. And I would really be very kind if, if anyone can adhere to this because we don't want any trouble with Madame Ramos when she comes back for the closing session. So that seems important. Um, 
So before introducing you know, our panelists and, and the discussion, I would like to very briefly, this is really a short introduction to the forthcoming UNESCO repository of civil societal organizations dedicated to AI. And this is closely related to the overall purpose of this panel to broaden inclusion and to bring all hands on deck. Um, now this repository is an online open access database and it will be published as part of the, uh, the, the uh, AI ethics observatory which has been launched yesterday. Now the repository will provide information on but also the possibility to contact and reach out to NGOs and civil societal organizations from around the world uh, as well as to, uh, it aims also to facilitate a collaboration between, uh, so, sorry, no, I, I think I, I mixed, mi mixed it up here, sorry. So um, yeah, it will provide the possibility, it will uh, information to reach out to civil societal organizations and NGOs from around the world whose uh, work addresses issues related to the ethical, the societal, and also the environmental implications of AI. Now that was actually the right sentence. Now we really have aimed for broad global coverage and uh, representation and to achieve this we have uh, identified around 500 organizations that we have invited to be included in the database and this is a, an ongoing process. So the repository aims to enable new forms of cooperation and knowledge exchange between civil societal organizations from around the world but also between civil societal organizations and other AI stakeholders. Um, uh, you know, it also aims to provide new opportunities uh, for collaboration between UNESCO and civil societal organizations in the different world regions, which is also an important point. And more generally, the repository aims to strengthen the role of civil societal organizations in the global debate, co-design and governance of AI. So to achieve and work towards these, these aims, we also will have a workshop, that a larger online workshop with CSOs from around the world that will take place later on in this year. And now finally, we can start uh, with the discussion. So thank you all for, for the attention. So we have, in the first round, we have, uh, you know, more, it's more a discussion statement, and I would like to everyone, invite everyone to provide, a, you know, some key points on this. So the, the statement here, or the question is, please discuss innovative approaches and examples that aim to enhance the participation of civil societal organizations, different publics, and other stakeholders in the global debate, the co-design and governance of AI, and also which tactics or methods could be deployed to strengthen the involvement of diverse stakeholders in different global regions. Now, in order to structure the discussion, I would first of all like to invite intervention from panelists, from NGOs and CSOs, then from AI researchers, and finally from social scientists and, and policy experts. Now, let's briefly start with the panelists from the civil societal organization. It's my very great pleasure to welcome Fadi Dao, Executive Director of Global Ethics, Jamila Venturini, um, uh, Co-Executive Director of Derechos Digitale in Chile, Anita Gurumulti, uh, ex Executive Director of IT for Change in India, um, Fernanda K. Martins, Director of Research at Internet Lab, and Katharina Zügel, uh, uh, Policy Manager of the Forum uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, policy manager of the Forum on Information and Democracy. So maybe, maybe let's, uh, please, maybe we can start on this side and then move our way over there. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you. So, um, we have been talking about governance and inclusive governance uh, during uh, this forum for two days. Uh, and we have been focusing, I think, mainly on regulations and risk management when it comes to governance. I would like to uh, highlight another aspect which is very important in governance, which is strategy setting and resource mobilizations for solutions creation and innovation. Uh, and um, in this perspective, I think this is the, the way to ensure that uh, um, AI is really inclusive. And when I say this, I'm thinking about the low and middle income countries. Uh, because AI, I believe uh, it can be uh, a good news to bridge the gap within societies and, and between societies. Practically speaking, this means that we need resources. We need uh, governance to decide on, on, on creating resources. For example, we can create an, a global investment fund in startups in the uh, low and middle income countries with incubators to uh, resolve the problem of the lack of the right infrastructure there and to develop solutions um, homegrown solutions using AI, and this would bring this contribution on the, on the global level. I will end uh, by saying we were a few weeks ago at the COP28 discussing the need for a loss and damage fund, you know, with billions to try to compensate somehow and to repair the damages uh, produced. We don't want to be in the same situation in 10 years and looking for a loss and damage fund uh, in relation to the AI. If we invest today one million with, with startups in the right way, it will have the value of one billion in 10 years. If we don't invest this one million now, we will have, we'll need one billion in 10 years to repair the, the loss and damages we cause. Thank you very much, Fadi, for your intervention and contribution. Well, let me follow up, uh, beginning by thanking the opportunity to be here and thanking for the very interesting uh, provocation for this panel. Uh, we are very pleased to be a part of the CSO repository that was just presented, and we hope to co-create it into a significant mechanism for civil society oversight into the implementation of the guidelines. Coming back to your question, Akin, I would like to bring a first point in this discussion that it cannot happen in isolation, and there is no need to invent the wheel when we talk about civil society participation in governance processes. We have been discussing these processes for multi-stakeholder governance at least for 20 years when it comes to internet government governance and let's remember that the global internet governance forum is only one instance inside this full process for uh, internet governance that has national and regional instances also. We also have uh, international and national standards that already establish the need for prior consultations when it comes to indigenous groups and uh, initiatives that can affect their rights or territory. As much as we are aware that these initiatives could and need to be enhanced towards an even more equitable ec ecosystem, we cannot risk, risk um, exchanging them or replace, replacing them for solutions that have not been tested and we need really to um, find opportunities for peer learning. Another quick point I'd like to stress here is that we need proper accountability mechanisms when it comes to participatory processes also. It's not enough to open an online consultation, although it's very welcome that we have these uh, processes for consultation, but we also need concrete commitments and transparent processes that should not rely on the goodwill of certain decision makers in a particular period of time. We also need dedicated uh, funds and commitments for this to be a reality. And the final point I would like to bring, uh, not to extend so much in time, is that both at the global governance level and inside countries, proactive actions should be taken to mitigate power imbalances uh, that will mostly affect um, communities and organizations' capacity to meaningfully engage uh, with these processes. Again, an open consultation is very welcome, but it might look like a neutral strategy while it leaves behind precisely the groups that are facing the worst emergency emerging from multiple inequalities worldwide. Thank you very much, Daniela. Could I also quickly remind everyone to you know, try to stick to 90 seconds to two minutes simply so that everyone can has equal time to speak. Uh, Fernando, maybe you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank you, Nesco, for this rich opportunity for discussion. Uh, well, 
um, a critical point when addressing the involvement of various stakeholders is the issue of the terms of this participation. Sometimes, when attempting to integrate discussions on AI and diversifying social actors, we might think that some countries possess developed technologies, while others have the need to use these same technologies. Similarly, the belief that some countries are ahead in legislative discussions and models, while others are behind, needs closer scrutiny. If you look at AI merely as a rapidly developing technology that can save us from globally faced problems, or as a technology that must have its risks mitigated, we are only considering part of the question. In recent work with indigenous societies and by initiating discussions on meaningful connectivity at Internet Web, we have learned that it's not enough to have technologies to share with indigenous people if we ourselves are not open to rethink and revising how we perceive, use, and develop technologies. Yes, regulation and risk mitigation are crucial, but more than that, there is a need to create a space for understanding, not only in terms of governments and companies, but also broadly socially and ask, what AI technologies are required by other populations that are not represented in spaces like these, as the case of indigenous, for example? There is an opportunity for mutual learning. We have talked a lot about trust and sharing it in the last two days, but we need to take a step back and ask ourselves in ge geopolitical terms, who is considered capable of sharing what and the under what conditions should this trust be established? Are we managed to address asymmetries and place historical discomfort in the right place in this discussion? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fernanda. Let's move to the, uh, you know, to the other left and uh, uh, Anita, maybe you can continue, please. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that immense contributions have been made by a range of social actors, especially in framing the debate and continuously unearthing inaccuracies and blind spots of the AI paradigm. But what I think is really important is the contributions that challenge the AI status quo. Since much of AI is about unknown unknowns, the AI paradigm needs us to be vigilant about injustice. Unearth what is going wrong and for whom. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the workers' movements, the labor movements, that have exposed the perils of algorithmic management, enabling courts and lawmakers to move the needle and recognize what needs to be done. I'd like to acknowledge social justice movements that have shown the cascading exclusions arising from the mutually reinforcing biases of the labor market and job ads. Feminists who have shown how gender misinformation is powered by profitable provocations. AI that is geared to find and amplify misogyny. And organizations like mine on digital justice that have repeatedly pointed to the wicked problem of AI and global economic injustice, drawing attention to connections between equity in data and justice in AI governance. In fact, we did the primer for GPI on economic justice. How do we strengthen all of these contributions, typically challenging the democratic deficit in AI governance? I think a key aspect is to look critically at what is actually meant when we use the buzzword of decolonizing AI. We can't decolonize AI solely by a politics of diversity in data or representativity in data sets. Decolonizing means three things. Broad basing and democratizing the resource regimes underpinning AI, the data and digital infrastructural resources that create new architectures of inequity in the world. Secondly, we need to challenge the given narratives that have driven the AI epoch as we know it. And we need rights regimes shaping AI, without which all the ethics that we are discussing will be notional. So as citizens, workers, indigenous people, we need the right to information, the right to scrutinize, the right to explanation, the right to be consulted, the right to challenge impunity, so that ethics and rights can go hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Anita. Um, yes, maybe a little applause would actually be indeed be <laughs> so good. Very okay, Katarina, can you continue, please? Thank you very much, and thank you to Slovenia for hosting this event and UNESCO for the invitation. As been said in the introduction, civil society is often marginalized in these dialogues or only invited to consultation processes. And actually, we need much more bottom-up approaches where it's civil society, researchers, marginalized groups driving the policy debate and setting the, um, the parameters and the discourse of the policy debate. Um, and in that sense, I wanted to uh, share with you an initiative uh, of the Forum of Information and Democracy, which is actually a civil society organization, and that is bringing together organizations, civil society from the whole world, coalition of 50 organizations and researchers to come up with policy recommendations that we are then sharing with government. So there needs to be new ways that uh, civil society and research can be the drivers of these policy debates and that it's not uh, civil society just is invited as an addition to existing fora. But at the other hand, we also need to reform um, not just the global governance perspective, but also how AI companies work, because they are in the forefront of building uh, these systems. And that m requires, on the one hand, more democratic governance of these companies, which give uh, an actual seat to public interest representatives and users in governing boards or in supervisory councils that have a, a vote and can have an impact on the strategic direction of these companies but also um, equitable, sustained, and transparent involvement of different communities of civil society researchers in building these systems. So in you know, defining guidelines for data curation, in defining uh, red teaming, human labeling, and there need to be processes that are transparent and uh, fair for everyone so that the companies are not the only ones making the decisions on how the AI system works and what are the strategic directions to be taken for the uh, future of AI. Thank you very much, Katarina. Please provide a brief round of applause for our first round of speakers <laughs> from all the uh, civil society organizations. Let's continue with the interventions of AI researchers. And the, the, I would like to welcome Craig Ramler, head of the control system group of the University of the West Indies at St. Augustine. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago and member of the UNSG's High Level Advisory Board on AI. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks, UNESCO and Slovenia. Um, so I, I agree with the panel. I completely agree with most of the statements that has been made. What I want to do is I want to take a different approach and look at it from the Caribbean because I do want to say something that has already been said. One of the things that we keep saying is that data and talent go hand in hand. These are the things that we need to capacitate regions to have to push forward. But you know, one of the issues that we have, especially in the Caribbean region, is that once we capacitate people to work with these, we give them the, the knowledge to develop these AI systems, and we don't create the AI ecosystem that allows these students to go out and use these things to have jobs, we have brain drain happening in the Caribbean. Uh, this is difficult, this is a problem, this is a disaster if we allow things like these to happen. It has to be a, a managed approach to how we, pre, how we develop these strategies and these systems. I think this is a very fantastic way for civil organizations, civil societies, to be included in the development of policy frameworks that would allow these managed processes to happen. And maybe when we do these kinds of things and we capacitate our own local people, have our own local indigenous data, they produce their own systems that are built culturally for their own problems, then maybe we can have these civil organizations also regulate these technology companies or incentivize these technology companies to be regulated in a fair way. That's my contribution. Thank you very much, Craig. Our next intervention comes from Ulysses Cortis, High Performance Artificial Intelligence Group Manager from Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So thank you very much uh, for having me here. Thanks, UNESCO, for the invitation. So I, I will make a, as normally a, an orthogonal intervention. So I was looking for an innovative example to enhance participation. And when we look at in our group to find, to identify this innovative example, uh, we decided to present Decidim. Decidim Barcelona 
is a platform that has been in use several years. It's an AI-based system that promotes the participation of citizens and uh, organizations in the government of the city. So basically, at the very beginning, was just just for a, a small dotation referendum. There was, has been used in a large referendum that will modify the geography of the city just to put a trunk that will go north to south. But now, uh, using AI, more advanced AI techniques, is used to uh, to capture the ideas of citizens, and then you create voting systems, and those voting systems will inform the decisions of the city council. And now uh, there is a part of the budget that can be voted by citizens directly. And the new problem is how you add all these different opinions from citizens to be, let's say, collected, resumed, and then informing the, uh, uh, the local governments. Now it's on, on work. It's still working. 70% of all the initiatives that have been promoted through to the city are were they were enforced and empowered by the local government. So I believe this kind of uh, initiatives can work if we have the infrastructure and we have this idea through different governments. So now we have, I believe, it's at least three mayors that have been keeping uh, this uh, initiative alive. So you need that the city uh, takes the uh, instrument for itself and do not hesitate in use AI-based systems for the good of the city. Thank you very much. We have our next intervention comes from John Shaw Taylor, the director of the International Research Center on Artificial Intelligence and also UNESCO chair of AI at UCL in London. Um, yes, thanks. And um, I, I would like to take a slightly different uh, angle in that um, I completely agree and have far less to say about how uh, the participation of organizations that can contribute in the forming of policy. But what I, I think is also important in the theme of we have today, which is this let's work together and move forward together, is actually to be critical of the AI systems themselves and how they fail to involve people and under, uh, allow people to understand th what is happening in their use. And I think here there is a great opportunity because there is actually the capability to communicate much more transparently to users how AI systems are actually operating and to make them uh, empower, um, uh, the, the systems empower people and enable them to use them creatively in new ways. What I'm trying to say is that rather than have just one or two companies and small startups driving forward the new development, we want to distribute that and have this happening in all regions and in all contexts so that the development can really reflect the needs of local regions, local groups, and create the equality that can then be driven bottom up rather than necessarily uh, also, but if not exclusively, uh, uh, brought in through regulation. I think this will create the sort of groundswell of understanding and use of AI that can really drive transformation at a much more inclusive and progressive way. Thank you very much, Don. Please provide a brief round of applause for the contributions of our AI researchers. So now we come to the to the third group. We have uh, you know reflections from social scientists, policy, policy advisors, or a combination of, of both. And I would like to you know start with uh, Anil Chaturi, policy advisor, Aspire to Innovation Program, ICT Division, and the Cabinet Division at the Government of Bangladesh. Thank you, Akim. Uh, <clears throat> thanks to Slovenia and UNESCO to organize this very interesting set of discussions. Just a few months ago at the UN General Assembly, I was in a panel with Vin Cerf, who was uh, considered one of the fathers of the internet. And he was talking about how AI governance is fundamentally different from internet governance, because it can change our lives 
and has actually in much more fundamental ways than internet has. So some futurists have compared AI with fire. So the invention of fire. So that's where we're at right now. Um, let me draw from one example from COVID, which actually brought the entire society together, government, private sector, civil society, researchers. Uh, in a country of 175 million people, when we had COVID uh, just about four years ago, we realized that we had only one PCR lab. So we had to use artificial intelligence by asking people to self-report symptoms and using the data uh, from telcos, from communities, through the civil society organizations, researchers from within the country and from abroad, uh, diaspora researchers, actually developed algorithms that allowed us to track the disease, the concentration, for the first three to four months, because we had only one PCR lab as we developed the labs. So this actually gave us the unprecedented thinking that collaboration is possible when the need is there. So collaboration is a rhetoric when the true need is not there, but when it's, when it's needed, people actually come together. And that gave rise to two approaches. One led by the government, by our cabinet secretary, who's the head of civil service. So since 2021, we've been actually working with 280 plus organizations within the government, uh, hundreds of, uh, civil society organizations, universities, and industry associations to see how AI can actually enable public service delivery, improve healthcare, education outcomes, uh, disaster management, so on and so forth. And the second approach has really been led by researchers and civil society organizations, which we call e-quality. So we're trying to figure out the causes of digital divide in the, in the, in the society. And we've found three causes. One, obviously, connectivity. Second is lack of the right skills. And AI skills have become very, very important, not just digital skills, because AI can actually prove that we don't need digital literacy because you can actually talk to the computer and access services. So that's a, that's a new paradigm that we're looking at. And the third uh, cause of digital divide that we have seen is the design of services and how AI plays a role there in terms of information and power asymmetry in society. So these are the three things, connectivity, uh, uh, skills, and service design are causes of digital divide. And that's, that research is led by our civil society and research organizations. So the two approaches that have come from COVID, one led by the government and another led by civil society is really giving us confidence that we'll probably come up with good regulation of AI that we've been talking about for the last two days. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Amir. The next contribution or intervention comes from Abdurrahman Habib from the International Center for AI Research and Ethics. Thank you very much for UNESCO and for Slovenia for, uh, for this great um, conference. From, um, from the, our perspective, we noticed that um, the strategy plays a key role in here. Um, building better AI, I think, is one of the main answers. Better mean built by diverse uh, stakeholders, that's inclusive, that is accessible, but also trusted and will put all the requirement to be trusted and transparent in the design and from the strategy at the beginning. Um, building better AI will solve way so many uh, problems that we are talking about today and we are trying to manage. And very similar to what Anir mentioned earlier, um, this better design or strategy does not work by itself. I think there are three main keys uh, that you need to add to it. First is the capacity building. So education is one of the most important parts. Uh, if we educate the population and educate the users and educate even the providers about all the risk and, and, uh, and the policies required, then we are increasing adoption. And we are talking about an opportunity here. So this opportunity, you either take it and utilize it, especially for developing countries, this is very important. It can mean the leapfrog to many countries to utilize those resources and improve the services and the quality of the services. Then facilitating the dialogue and providing the feedback and AI will play another role here. Because having a feedback, as mentioned in Barcelona and others, ha having a feedback 
with, with every or as many users as possible that can be fed again to the system can help a lot in improving the design and make it more iterative with, with the feedback that you receive. And finally, awards and recognition. So there are certain companies that build better products and I think those can be rewarded and, and uh, talked about and celebrated because they are better, building better products. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdul uh, Rahman. So our, our next uh, uh, contribution comes from uh, Marco and Joan Dilak, the co-director of the Observatory on the Social Impacts of AI and Digital Technologies. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I will briefly argue that AI has the potential to help implement uh, UNESCO's recommendation on the ethics of uh, AI, and in particular to improve uh, public uh, participation. So Im imagine uh, it's um, 1901, and the streets of uh, Ljubljana uh, are already lit with electricity. And we, experts from all over the world, uh, are meeting for a forum um, on the ethics of uh, electricity. Now imagine that during this forum, um, our conference room is still lit by candlelight. What kind of message uh, would we be sending out to the world uh, with uh, this uh, situation? So in uh, 2017, um, in Quebec, we, uh, uh, we initiated the first citizen deliberation uh, on AI ethics with the Montreal Declaration, and I had the privilege uh, to uh, conduct a global uh, citizen uh, deliberation as part of UNESCO's uh, consultation on the recommendation um, of, uh, on AI ethics. And my deep conviction uh, is that people must have the right to shape their lives and their environment, obviously, and to voice their needs and expectations. And actually, UNESCO's approach to AI is precisely to empower the people in the face of AI, but also with AI. So the avenue I'm um, uh, um, exploring right now is one where AI is a companion to enable us to bring people together in the conversation on AI governance. And today with uh, large language uh, uh, models, <clears throat> AI can participate in a deliberation and make relevant uh, contributions. So obviously we, we don't want uh, uh, AI like ChatGPT uh, to replace human beings, but to dialogue with them. And properly used, I believe that uh, AI has the potential to accelerate human learning during deliberation uh, workshops, saving time, uh, for instance, to filter out, to screen out uh, uh, weak arguments, and to focus on pressing issues. So AI doesn't provide us with solutions, but it simply brings clarity to the issues uh, at stake. So I have conducted um, several uh, uh, experiments with ChatGPTs, and I'm currently writing a, a paper on, on it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mark Antoine. So our final intervention now comes from Theodor Lechtermann, from UNESCO Chair, uh, who is a UNESCO Chair on the Ethics and Governance of AI at the IE University. Thank you, Akim. Um, so I. As an academic, I think of AI ethics as a sort of tremendous success story in the dissemination of academic research, right? AI ethics began as a set of concerns cultivated in academia, but it's now part of the global public agenda. It's part of tabletop conversations happening in many households around the world. So it began in academia, but I think it's also important sometimes to return to academia, to have another look, to consult with academics about you know, potential new insights, new sources of criticism, um, and so on. So I'm, I'm pleased to be talking um, about one new source of insight, which is um, the new UNESCO Chair in AI Ethics and Governance, which is about to launch at IE University. Now, the UNESCO Chairs Program is uh, 32 years old. Uh, or so, it's a, it's a program of partnership between UNESCO and universities to promote research, education, and outreach on areas of priority interest to UNESCO. And now, the chair at IE University won't be the first chair in AI. John has a 
very prestigious chair in, in AI as well. But it will be the first to focus explicitly on the implementation of the UNESCO recommendation for the ethics of AI. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about our various initiatives. Happy to talk about those uh, offline with anybody who's interested. But I do want to mention sort of one key cornerstone of the UNESCO Chairs Program, which is um, collaboration between Global North and Global South. Um, so the, the collaboration between Global North and South is one key pillar of the UNESCO Chairs Program. And so we're very excited to be partnering with universities um, in South Africa and Colombia in order to connect researchers and students from Spain, where IE University is based, uh, with researchers in Africa and South America. And I think this idea of research exchanges, exchanging people, ideas, resources um, between different regions, between different countries, is one key way we can think about sort of bridging the divide and making AI governance more inclusive. Thank you very much, uh, Theodore. Please share me for some applause for all uh, speakers so well, up to this point for a great and insightful discussion. Now, time is, of course, against us. It's not really on our side. However, we have about 19 minutes left, so this provides us you know, with possibilities of a short contribution of roughly maybe one minute per speaker and a final wrap-up by Daphne at the end, which is also maybe have to reserve maybe four or five minutes or three or four minutes, three minutes, three minutes uh, at the end. And I think we should just go, you know, from, from, the, from the right to the left and just without any further complications. So we have a discussion statement. Please provide, you know, it's not a discussion statement. It's actually a question to provide recommendations and forward-looking insights on how civil societies, academia, policymakers, industry leaders and other stakeholders can collaborate to ensure more inclusive and participatory AI governance at a national, regional, and, and global levels. In one minute. So <laughs> I, I believe that it has been said to the uh, uh, infinite, we need uh, to educate people in digital skills. And there's only one way to educate uh, new generations. Maybe the actual generations are lost. What we need is to create uh, proper uh, programs to educate teachers for primary schools and secondary schools for them to teach the kids. Because the parents are unable, because they are, let's say, uh, digital analphabets. And we have uh, a very skillful users, but they do not understand the technology. So if you don't want to lose a new generation, please educate the teachers to do that at the primary and secondary schools. Thanks. Well, this is a multidimensional problem. We could address it from different perspectives. I would like to stress the need for effective accountability and enforcement mechanism. Um, and this could include creating, for instance, as someone suggested before, databases or certification mechanisms that make sure that AI products available in the market comply with environmental, labor, data protection and human rights standards and even banning the products that do not comply with those standards as was suggested by UN experts before, for instance, when it comes to facial recognition that continues to be implemented, although they are very much questioned about the abuses they generate. Another example I would like to share would be to create multi-stakeholder collaboration to build commitments for, for instance, minimum wage for data labelers that to the date are being underpaid and pretty much exploited in several regions of the world. And um, uh, they're lacking protection in this sense and countries are being left alone trying to push for proper compliance of existing legislation while companies sometimes find their ways of escaping national accountability. So I think there are different ways to address that. There are interesting ideas coming from feminist groups also, as Anita mentioned before, in terms of how do we reimagine AI that does not come from commercial perspectives, I guess, as was mentioned before, and there are increasing work being done about which principles should be considered, and participation is one of them, including at the design process and etc. topics that have been widely explored also by the UNESCO guidelines, but I think questioning the imaginaries behind technology is uh, 
one of the elements we could continue to collaborate on. Please try to stick to like one minute of the like something on the infrastructure. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, an important aspect of collaboration lies in the terms in which we establish data exchanges. We talk about training AI with data from the Global South, which is excellent and necessary in terms of combating biases. But how do we ensure that it's not just a one-sided relationship where the Global South provides data in this exchange and the Global North only offers technologies that we will consume. Who is considering a researcher? On what terms will research be shared? Look at the reality of our, our countries in Latin America. How do we avoid turning our sensitive data from historically marginalized populations into new materials to be consumed at a low cost by companies from the North? I think we are facing here the possibility of building a new global epistemolog epistemological shift, sitting at the table face each other, undoing the hierarchical gaze that has shaped our history until now. We all have knowledge to offer, but how have we historically measured this knowledge and which data do we transform into those with more or less value. Is sensitive data more or less protected? We know that it is. I believe these are some questions that we need to face carefully to produce together a different moment of research and of technologies in the world. Thank you. Short story as we noticed um, in Saudi Arabia. People are afraid of the new technology. Everyone in education at that time mentioned that they need to regulate, prohibit, or do something again about uh, chat GPT or the use of AI in the school. What we did, we did a massive program with, um, with the Ministry of Education for teachers in high school and middle school on AI. Platform where they learn what, how, how to use AI and how to uh, use it in classes and how they teach AI to students in, in a game. Surprisingly, not many of them ask later on about regulation because they, they learned more about the technology itself. Their students are more educated about the technology and also the teacher now can evaluate and understand what's been made by AI and how can they uh, react to it. So I think education is the key and education with hands-on type of education will make a big difference. Wonderful. So I will build on what Habib just shared, three words, dialogue, education, and innovation. Dialogue, I mean multi-stakeholder dialogue. That's great to have this panel involving civil society in this, uh, in this dialogue, but we need multi-stakeholder dialogue, which means we're on the same table or on the same panel, we have all stakeholders represented. We launched a, a, a process of multi-stakeholder international dialogue, this perspective. On the website of Globe Ethics, you can already download the draft zero of the first round of this dialogue of multi-stakeholder. The title is Inclusive Citizenship, Inclusive AI, sorry, for a better world. Uh, secondly, education. I think education is a sector, one of the industries that is most affected and will be tr completely transformed by AI, but is still very much underrepresented in the discussions and on the agenda. So I invite you also, if you are interested in this, um, in this field, to a leadership summit uh, on AI and education with the ICDs that you are hosting in Geneva in June, also on the website of Globetics, you have all the information. And thirdly, innovation. I mentioned at the beginning, we need resources to, uh, to uh, make the civil society on a very wide sense. Civil society as also initiating um, initiatives and transforming initiatives into startups that bring solution uh, to this problem. So anybody interested in, um, in um, contributing and launching uh, incubators for responsible AI everywhere in the world, reach out, please. Thank you. I didn't think that there would be a second round. We'd get to that. So I just finished what I wanted to say the first round, but I'll re-emphasize. I think uh, collaboration happens because of a need. COVID provided that need, and we saw unprecedented collaboration 
we made huge policy decisions over WhatsApp. We didn't need to host meetings because we couldn't host meetings. So there was a need. I'll give you a couple of examples. The, I talked about how the two-pronged approach that we have, the government approach and the civil society research approach are, are, are converging. We are coming up with new data protection policies. We have an AI policy that, uh, that, are, that are being consulted right now, and it's not being consulted the way you talked about it, that it's not just uh, driven by government and participated by private sector. It's actually a collaborative process, I think. I'll give you one example uh, where we are seeing to monitor pregnancies, high-risk pregnancies in the country, we didn't have an approach before. We had 60 to 70,000 workers uh, in the government, and it's equal number in the, in, the, in the civil society who would go from door to door for antenatal visits. But with AI, we're looking at an approach, again, government, civil society, research organizations are working on it together to find an approach so that we can identify the high-risk pregnancies so that these almost 150,000 workers can go to the high-risk pregnancies first. So that's, a, again, a combined approach. So I think the policies, regulations, those would help us, but we need to identify specific needs of society where this collaboration can actually happen. And that's where we will see true collaboration, not with laws and regulations and policies. Those will help us, but we need to identify the needs and have people work on those needs. Thank you. So I think the um, thing I would emphasize is the research angle. And based on the fact that I think AI is challenging humanity to rethink itself in some sense because where we were seeing ourselves as the intelligent animal, that's no longer perhaps quite the way we can define ourselves. We need to reevaluate what it is to be human, and that will then inform a deeper understanding of how we should regulate and how we should approach AI and how it should be used in the service of all of humanity. I think this is something that's very urgent, and I think that it's... a you know, I would come to the research agenda that was proposed. I believe it is something where we need uh, a multidisciplinary approach to really rethinking how we approach these systems in order to make the benefits available and not the dangers. Maybe in line with the, what my predecessor just said, I think there's actually a precondition for research and civil society to be effectively involved and to have this collaboration, and that is equal access to resources and access to the AI system to study them, so that we can actually study what are the tra training sets, what are, how are the algorithms working through experimental evaluations and not just depending on the few data that AI companies need to, to share. So really um, providing much more access to these systems, to the metrics, to the risk assessment, to everything that's conducted internally by the companies is what is a precondition for researchers, uh, civil society to be really well informed about how these systems function, what are the risks, how to evaluate them, and then be involved in policy and regulatory making. And the Digital Service Act is a first step in that direction, but it only concerns uh, big um, s search engines and social media companies and even doesn't go s so far as far as uh, allowing like uh, experimental evaluations on their platforms. So I think that's really, uh, we have to think about the preconditions for effective collaboration and that is one of them. Thank you. Uh, well, to, to, to bring, uh, you know, uh, uh, stakeholders and we <coughs> talked about uh, multi-stakeholders uh, uh, um, uh, processes and civil societies together we need first to trust the expertise of uh, citizens, lay people, uh, and we have to prove, to show that we trust them. So when we design a um, deliberative process um, and uh, when we uh, set it out, uh, we, we, we must meet three basic and obvious rules. First, don't rush it. Second, don't make it last too long either. And finally, show you care. So. Don't rush it, otherwise uh, people will be suspicious and uh, wonder whether their voices and opinions really matters to you, really matter to you. And um, this is one thing. Um, second, uh, you don't want to unduly uh, extend the process, otherwise the people will have the impression that their contributions 
are diluted in a very complex and bureaucratic uh, uh, process. And finally, show you care about them by adapting uh, deliberation processes and, and, and consultations to their cultural and social uh, uh, um, identities um, to uh, diversity. Um, so it's especially uh, uh, critical when you want to engage with indigenous people like we've, de we've done uh, in, in, in Canada. There is no such thing as you know, uh, as uh, one size fits all. This idea has come up before in another context, but I think it's important for us to focus not only on the how of inclusion, but also to remind ourselves of the why. Why exactly is inclusion valuable? And I think there's a popular idea which says that you know, inclusion is valuable because having more people at the table, more minds, more data, more perspectives leads to better results, more closely tracks the truth, gets better outcomes, what have you. And that's, that's a powerful, that's a compelling idea. But there's another sense of inclusion, that inclusion is necessary for justifying the exercise of power. And insofar as AI is deeply and inevitably shaping people's lives, they are owed a seat at the table. And refusing to include people, excluding people, is not just something that's unfortunate, but it can actually be a denial of moral equality, a denial of human rights. So I think you know, keeping this other sense of inclusion in mind um, it is important. Uh, and I would even suggest that it forces us to reframe the question slightly or to add a corollary question, which is which forms of exclusion are objectionable and how can we work towards their elimination? And not only sort of how can we promote inclusion as a positive value. So I, I think I have a story to follow up on most of the contributions here. Um, so we tried to launch the, we in the Caribbean are a marginalized group. You can say that, we can say that we don't have the data necessary. So we are not really included in global participation of AI. And so we tried to launch this open data strategy to get data from the Caribbean nations. And what ended up happening was the Caribbean nations, the people said, well, why are we giving you the data? What are you going to do with our data? Is what you are going to do with our data going to benefit us? Show us how. And I think that, that says a lot there, right? One, the trust of the lay people and, and what they are saying, their contributions. Two, you know, the education of the lay people and how, what is the public discussions? How do we manage the public uh, you know, narrative around AI? And three, are we actually giving back the people the, the, the use of the technology, the benefit of the technology. So I think that when we, when we talk about all these things and we actually have to enact it, we need to look at promoting inclusive development. We need to look at adopting inclusive strategies. And, and we can only get that if the people are included in the discussions that we have. And that, I, I, I believe, would allow the research individuals to have uh, an integrated understanding of ethics and values when we begin training these systems. The last participant on the last panel. Um, yes, I think collaboration is vital, but it must come out of a rules based system where trust is a consequence of democracy, equity, a certain baseline of fairness. Many times um, I fear we talk about trust as if it's plug and play. Uh, we need big changes to international economic law, I think, especially the IP regime, and bring in the public interest as a missing piece in inclusive AI governance. Today, innovation systems are under siege and not able to evolve independently. They are not available for applications in public AI ecosystems. All along, big tech has used and abused trade secrets protection, commercial secrets protection, appropriating huge amounts of data, public data, data of cities, data of communities. On the other hand, even as they talk of data for good, the big platforms are making their data non-scrappable. Trade agreements are weaponized against people and democratic systems in developing countries through non-disclosure clauses that prevent them from scrutinizing AI. So clearly, current IP and trade regimes make AI governance inherently non-inclusive. 
smaller firms, women-run startups, co-ops are unable to participate in innovation as larger firms hold data. IP allocation, intellectual property allocation, is not a neutral choice. It's a distributive equity matter. It's not a mat matter of balancing rights, but it is about public interest. So what I want to conclude with is we need a commons approach. We need a commons approach to manage data and innovation ecosystems that look different. Different imaginations, different aspirations, different worldviews. Maybe public community AI partnerships. Could I very, very kindly thank you, thank all contributors, all panelists for your great contributions and ideas. Surprisingly enough, you're almost done. Daphne, can I kindly ask you for a final reflection of a few minutes? And I, I can't see Madame Ramos yet. I think you're still allowed with a, to extend three, four minutes. Thank you very much. I, I don't know if I really need to thank you because this is too challenging. <laughs> um, and also, I, I need to show to you what happened. I was taking notes with this thing that is called Remarkable, and I took very nice notes, and then it says out of battery. <laughs> so here is the result. <laughs> I tried to put in writing what I was writing uh, electronically. So um, I would say that they were, um, they were some, some uh, coinciding points uh, in the first round and the second in the conclusion. So I will try to, to, try to summarize what I, what I took. So um, I think there was, a, there was a big, I liked uh, um, those uh, interventions where they were calling for challenging, challenging uh, the, the, the structures, the current way of uh, including civil society and different actors. Uh, calling for challenging uh, and, and being comfortable in challenging the differences and imbalances in power and inequalities. Uh, the last ones, for example, calling to challenge the way in which we think the governance and uh, calling for a change in the IP systems and making them, and defining that uh, by definition they are not inclusive. Uh, the bottom-up uh, uh, things that have been uh, proposed, but let me go a, a little bit more in, in order. Uh, how to include in the consultations, not, uh, on, I mean, the way, in, the way in which we include the different stakeholders, which I, th I found is also super important, and who are going to be included, how, which are, who is in excluded, uh, uh, that was also referred. Uh, the conditions in which we conduct these consultations uh, with many a priori about the access to technologies or not, or to information or, or the regulatory systems, and how are we going to make sure that those who are living in, the, in most in those more vulnerable uh, situa situations and more in, them or in the inequalities are going to be included? Uh, I think this is very important. Uh, I think it's really interesting also when we speak about uh, education and education of lay people. And on the other hand, we are also saying like everyone is an expert and we have to take into account the expertise of everyone. And I think this is also very, very important. Uh, the commitment, the transparency and the funds and the showing care when you do the consultation, uh, not to rush them, but also to make sure that there is this accountability, uh, this education, the prior, the, the preconditions that I also thought were very important uh, for research, but also for uh, real participation, for people to be available, to, to be able to do the real scrutinize of, this, of the systems, to make sure, as John was saying, like the systems are really uh, are really serving us, our purposes or not, and so how we redefine them. I also want to, to underline uh, the reference that was done for the right that we have to be consulted and the right uh, to shape the lives the way we want with AI in the face of AI or without AI, <laughs> which was not necessarily mentioned, but I want to add that <laughs> from my own. <laughs> uh, if you allow me, since I have the mic. Education uh, already from... Uh, 
from the primary school, uh, which is also very important. It was co it was the ed education was also mentioned across uh, across uh, the board, and uh, uh, we got uh, very nice examples about uh, uh, what happens, uh, for example, in Barcelona and uh, other other examples for the citizens' the, the uh, dialogues and the, um, <coughs> deliberations that have been taking place. Um, uh, banning products that do not comply with what we want and we, with, the, with the regulations and the principles that we have agreed that are important. Uh, the multi-stakeholder collaboration uh, and making sure that these that are underpaid and I mean making again, going back again to the injustices that everybody has underlined as well, I think is very important. Um, those continue. Ah, I think this is also super important. The uh, the reinvention and, uh, uh, that the uh, of AI uh, that it doesn't come from uh, from the perspective of the commercial side, reinventing it, and from the general perspective and, and many others as we have decided. Very important as well when we say about uh, taking into account uh, information from other regions that it has to be a two-way uh, street and to ensure that this will not be uh, perpetuating the, colon the, I mean, in a way, colonization or abuses or of using the information of people as it was mentioned in the Caribbean and from other colleagues. Okay, we, get, we gather information for the South, we give it to the North and then we only are consumers. And that also brings me back to some ideas and some suggestions about the, inv and, uh, the need to invest and to diverse the inversion to make sure that there is uh, that there is enough uh, startups and uh, that the ones that are producing the technologies are across and that we don't come back now with the loss and damages as we are also facing with climate change, for example, we don't want to get there. And you also gave a specific amount of one billion, if I'm if I'm correct. <laughs> so start opening your accounts <laughs> and see. Uh, I also think it was very important to say that these systems, uh, and it's all linked, need to be culturally designed. And uh, so it's not only about collecting the data from the local people, but also uh, building the systems according to these uh, cultural uh, 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 needs and, and idiosyncrasies, and to, to make sure that also these people can stay, which is also very important. Otherwise, we train them, they go, and they cannot stay in their own countries. The epistemology shifting, the epistemological shifting, no, uh, that we, that was also uh, discussed. The collaboration, but uh, making sure that this is bottom down. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I think I think I try to cover almost everything. And I think the last one is the public and community partnership instead of these IT systems. I I hope I covered most of them. Uh, it was very challenging and very interesting. And thank you very, very much. <laughs>